Live in three, two, one. Again, I better make sure my phone is on silent so it doesn't um, <laughs> during the stream. That's type in four. Yeah. Which group? Oh, it's just, my phone automatically tells me that Matt Bailey is live. That's how much you love me. That's how it works. <laughs> yes. Thank you too. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the national ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I'm covering again for the second week in a row now for Scott Fitzsimons, who's our usual moderator and host for uh, Whiskey Roundtable. This is week five. Uh, the idea behind Roundtable is that we get together with a group of friends, others who work in the trade, to talk about some of the subjects surrounding spirits, surrounding the bar scene, surrounding all the things that are good to whiskey. And of course, sometimes some other spirits and other discussions that arise out of it. We encourage questions, we encourage comments. Please keep them coming in. There was heaps last week, which was fantastic. And um, I'm just gonna, we're gonna take a moment now. I'm just gonna expand the screen out so we can see everyone. And uh, I'm gonna get everyone to actually, like we do each week, to introduce themselves so we can get a, um, uh, so you know who you're talking to, and so you can also direct some questions at these people. You can be watching this right now on, shortly, on Sydney Bartender Exchange, Melbourne Bartender Exchange, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, Australia. So I'm going to... Um, uh, I can't do that. Okay, we'll, oh, no. we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, so um, I might start with, with my top left. Uh, Emma, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Emma Cookson from Whiskey and Ailment over in Melbourne. Um, is that it for me? Okay, cool. Alex. Hey guys, Alex Dallenberg. I am from the Olna and the Speakeasy Group and also Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Awesome. Andy. Hey, I'm Andy Milne. I'm the brand manager for South Trade. And so I look after Paul John from India, Old Pulteney, Anox, Stabern from Scotland, um, Kuriyoshi from Japan, Buffalo Trace from the States. I feel like I've forgotten. And W Liberties from Ireland as well. <laughs> the big BT, yes. Lockie, hit us up. Uh, hi, I'm Lachlan. I am uh, the venue manager at Whiskey and Ailment in Melbourne. And I'm also the Melbourne representative Wonderland Drinks brands. So North Star Whiskey, Shelter Point Whiskey, and a few other fun stuff as well. Fun things as well. Awesome. And our special guest tonight, Laura Thomason. Please welcome and uh, tell us where you come from, what you do, and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Laura Thomason. I uh, am director of Spirits Box, which is a company that imports craft spirits into mainland China. Very cool. So we've got a very diverse uh, group, as always, every week. Uh, and some of the questions, some of the subjects tonight were um, surrounding uh, bars of the future, consumer habits, looking to the future, taking your questions live, etc., like that. So um, let's start, let's, let's kick it off. Andy, um, let's kick off with sort of current scene, future scene, what you see as bars of the future. Now, this can be related to current subject in terms of where we, what, what bars look like a year ago and what they look like now, of course, is very different. So where do you see that trajectory heading? And I'll, I'll start, with, start with Andy on that. Oh, wasn't going to start first. Oh, um, uh, let me just get this started. I'm used to set social media, but I think I've maybe correct, correctly clicked, clicked the right buttons. Um, okay. Just making sure all the streams are working, folks. We're all, we're all getting there. You're, you're muted as well now. Even better. Um, <clears throat> I'm muted. Buzz, what's, what's going on? So, I don't know. I think it's, it's a really interesting time now. Um, and I think you know, the, <clears throat> the the last year has been about sort of range and size of um, size of the back bar, and you know, I feel there's a, there's been a big sort of element of you know we've got the biggest whiskey list, we've got the biggest selection of you know American whiskies, we've got the biggest selection of independent whiskies, and, and so forth, and and it's been a great thing for customers to go in and be like, cool, this is broad breadth of, of spirits uh, from bar to bar uh from a cost perspective you know it's easy to, to collect that and gather that over the years now that we've enjoyed a pretty tough tough few months uh, i'm intrigued to see 
you know, whether that's going to be able to be maintained um, through majority venues and whether actually they'll be able to keep keep up with that level of, of stock, uh, but also whether it'll be sort of just concentrated and uh, whether we're sitting there going, okay, actually, what's important to us? What's, um, what delivers a, a GP that, that is helpful and, and is useful? And then what is, you know, rather than picking the, you know, 50 gins that we think make sense, let's reduce it down to 10 gins that we actually really love. And it's, you know, that sort of cyclical motion of, you know, sometimes having everything is great because then you can please everyone, but do we want to go back to actually just going, this is what, and, and it's, it's what, as, as, as bartenders, that's it's what you're there for to, to, to guide us as, as a consumer. Yeah. So, you know, you're the experts in knowing this, so rather than having so much variety, it's a case of, no, we pick these because these are our five favorite or our 10 favorites. Um, I think it's easier with gin, vodka than it is, you know, white spirits are easier than dark, but um are they know, are white easier than dark in that regard to pick from now i mean with the the, the range growing as it is it's, it's harder to pick from but it's um uh, in the way that it's probably been consumed across the vast majority of venues it's mm. easier to you know to mix to to, to that sort of possibility of the, the consumer you know you have a citrus led gin you have a juniper led gin you have a sort of floral led gin and and you've kind of covered most of the bases so you know, with whiskey, obviously, it's a completely different picture. But do we do we go and rest, you know, rein it in and say this is what we think is is actually more important to to what our customer wants? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Alex, you've been in you've been in bars for quite some time in in this regard, and you've seen the evolution of that, uh, especially with your venues. Uh, what does it look like for you? What's the future of bars look like at the moment? Um, I think we're all in a little bit uncharted territory right now. Um, none of us have ever sort of experienced this. Um, I think some of the things that we are looking at is we are going to have reduced trading when we first come back into it. Um, we're starting to put together our action plans now for Speakeasy Group to get back into um, how we're going to go back into the consumer trade uh, and open our doors. Uh, and I think that'll be at a, a reduced um, trading hours for the moment uh, until we start building it back out again. I think we've got a lot of people that won't trust straight away to get out and um, keep going. Um, like, I'm, I imagine we're gonna have a huge hit. Um, most of us youngins, well, I'll call myself young for the moment, for the best part of this story. Um, most of us will wanna just get out and have that quick out we go. But I think a lot of the population will also stay home for a little bit longer, stay safe. Um, and I, I think we're walking into something we don't know. I, Feel that we kind of hit a beautiful peak in hospitality uh, and I think we've got a long slog to get it back up to where it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean if you think about money um, we've all been sort of on reduced dollars or the ones that haven't been on reduced dollars they're going to be great for our industry um, because they probably have saved some money, saved some dollars staying at home. But we, we're probably looking at reduced trade for 12 to 18 months. Uh, mm. And that's just based on Australia. Like, we don't know what's going to happen with yeah. the global economy and how much it's going to affect us. Yeah. yeah I, I, I read an interesting one this morning that was uh, about the applications for JobKeepers um, and the biggest category was surprisingly accountants um and lawyers so it was it was it came under a, a mixed umbrella term that i can't recall now um but it's effectively saying it's you know legal professionals uh, accountants lawyers were yeah. the, the highest category i don't know if it's because the accountant is always looking after the dollar and so they're the first one in uh, and, and that's your answer right there <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's a it's a high it's a high spending group of customers that actually it flagged in my mind of just like, oh, that's, that's a, a concern because of that customer base. Yeah. Mm. We've got a question that says, do you think we'll have virtual taste? Do you think we'll see virtual tastings thrive after venues are trading again? Um, yes. Mm. I think a lot of our world yeah. is going to stay quite virtual. We've got companies that have now sent staff home um, that are now working from home. They may not need that huge office space anymore. People may be able to stay home. We've had to adapt our entire lives right Absolutely. now online. Um, and I feel that we've seen, 
we've seen companies shift from uh, sort of that brand ambassador into that co-role of either um, sort of part-time brand ambassador or a brand ambassador with sales capacity. Um, we've seen the, um, the alcohol industry shift that way. And I think that we're going to end up with a lot of other industries sort of dropping down because they don't need to have that um, manpower now. Everything's done virtually. Yeah. I mean, I agree. But it's, Emma, it would be good to get your opinion on this. For doing a tasting in a venue, you know, A, you're, you're supporting, a, you know, as, as a marketer, we're supporting a venue of someone that supports our products and so that's that's important to us to support our customers um <clears throat> but also you're then having people through the doors you're then probably having people consume that product in your venues so more likely to get more customers drinking that liquid in your venue over over a period of time um <clears throat> and it, it creates more revenue for your business rather than just putting a name to it because you know <clears throat> as we could put anyone's name to to a tasting and obviously you have the customers that we can advertise to, but only if you set up for that capacity. So, you know, for a, a bar to advertise, it's a lot easier to do it that way. But it's, yeah, how, if, if tastings went more virtually, how do you think that would impact WA? Uh, I think, well, at the moment we've got uh, a virtual online tasting booked in. I think it's, it's hard because you don't know which way people are going to swing. I think I completely agree with Alex for the, for the first while there is going to be this whole stigma of, I really want to go out for a drink, but is this okay? You know, um, am I, you know, you feel like you're breaking the law, but, um, mm. I think, I think yes, virtual tastings will have a place. And I think that, it's hard. I don't, I don't think it's going to be as huge afterwards as it is currently, obviously. Um, Cause I think that there's something a lot more meaningful in meeting that person and being there face to face. You know, a, a lot of the tastings that we have, people say it was really nice to chat to the person afterwards. And that's not something you would get one-on-one -on -one in a virtual tasting. And I think that's something that people will never really uh, shift away from, you know, They've, they've been tasting yeah. where people are like, sign my bottle or can I get a photo with you and stuff like that. And that's just not something you can do over technology. You know, it's, I think these online tastings are amazing, but I think the, the solid person in front of you kind of interaction that you wouldn't get otherwise is going to be enough that it's still viable in the post COVID economy. One, one, sorry, one thing I've seen like within China, um, obviously they're a couple of months ahead of where we are at the moment and how some bars have actually come through this and given amazing examples of how you can push forward, how you can, like how you can brand through sh being shut, how you can keep your name out there um through different partnerships with different uh spirit brands or like collabs and just kind of keeping solid online presence and a big part of that has been virtual tastings um i know the guys behind hope and sesame down in guangzhou they've been absolutely amazing at kind of keeping themselves with an online presence but a big part of that was how they partnered with different spirit brands and held the virtual tastings which not only um, like they would bottle up little bits of cocktails, anything that could travel and it would be sent out all across China. And like they'd have to give two weeks because of time, like timing and whatnot, but it meant that they could do these, these tasting sessions and these training sessions for people who live in regional areas or don't have an opportunity to travel to the bar and kind of created this much broader net of um of consumers suddenly in gone. some ways in some ways that's kind of like a that's kind of like even broadened the reach of the bar pre-covid yeah mm -hmm. and that's and that's lucky i'll just jump to you here for a second your your juice bags at whiskey and helmet is a good example of that there they are where you've got now people buying those interstate absolutely mm -hmm. so um we are actually sending about 
fifty percent of those, to my understanding, are interstate. That's awesome. Um, at least from what I've seen, which is really cool. And most of them are our consumer basis anyway, which travel to our bar maybe once a year or maybe twice a year. But these guys are now buying from us once a week and buying flights or boilermakers or you know jumping on to our online sessions to try and educate themselves while also enjoying some whiskey which has been pretty fun mm. um yeah it, it's definitely broadened it, it's allowed our broader community to involve themselves in our in our venue so yeah uh, I... question coming through from hayden he asks on the topic of growing the industry how are australian distillery is going to survive in a market that is becoming highly saturated especially post COVID-19 with discretionary spending likely to fall. The big one. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That lack of disposable income is a, a big concern for a lot of businesses, you know, mm. yeah. I think fires we had, we had flooding. <clears throat> um, we, we're going to do it tough, I think in the Australian distilling industry. Uh, yeah. And this is where I think as us as bars, um, this is where we need to get involved yeah. um, and maybe in, increase reaches of these guys um, and their visibility to keep them um, up and running and support, uh, support them through this time. Uh, in saying that, um, there are some ones doing great, great jobs in getting themselves out there during this time as well. So yeah. uh, anything that we can do as Australians to support our own distilling industry right now is huge, um, whether that's buying at home or buying in our bars. Um, for us, we're quite heavily contracted with our cocktails. Mm. So where I like to be able to do it is put it on the back one uh, and train the teams. And then the moment you put a bottle in with my teams and someone comes and trains them, they're instantly selling that straight away. Yeah. So I think in bars, um, as brands and venue owners and operators, I think to get Australia through this time, we need to jump in behind them. Yeah, yeah, entirely. Mm -hmm. um, It'd be a great time also, because at the moment the government is doing a lot of changes to different regulations. And like, when you think back to, what was it, 20 or 30 years ago, when there was, the, the, when the wine industry was severely, severely under pressure. Mm. And the, that's when the government changed the tax reg regulations for the wine industry now would be a fantastic time for them to actually petition to change the tax code, like the tax codes that severely disadvantages um, yeah, Australian, dis uh, Australian distillers. Yeah. yeah. I think they, they have quite a strong voice um, with the government at the moment, purely because they've, you know, so many of them have been producing um, hand sanitizer. And yeah. so they're having this really strong conversation of, you know, from their side, it's so positive. It's like, we're helping you, we're adapting for you. Mm. you know, mm. what, what you require, we will deliver for you. So um, <clears throat> the, chair, the chairman of the Australian Citizens Association is, has played a pivotal role in that and then communicating that to distillers. So it'll be interesting to see what the next step is for them. It's just like, Absolutely. okay, how do we take that conversation further and sort of go, okay, yeah. done all, the, all these things yeah. are done for you. It's just like, here's, here's how little. This is <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yeah, the other side is the one that's going to pinch. I think. I was um, in the polls the other day, and they had no name hand sanitizer on there, and I think it was just a refill pump. And because hand sanitizers are so heavily perfumed, and I struggle with perfume, um, I'd still done the um, shop, and I was like, oh, do I do it? Do I not? Pumped some, rubbed my hands on it, walked away, and I'm like, oh my god, new mates, like all. Oh, <laughs> Hi, Jane Overeem. Welcome to the chat. Yeah, welcome, Jane. Hey. Yeah, speaking uh, of Australian distilling. There's yeah. a there was a comment that came through here. It says, uh, "Bushfires, floods, COVID nineteen. Can't wait for COVID 20 Well, Mate, yeah, sure. You know, at least what, we yeah. don't have murder hornets. You know, we can be <laughs> thankful for no murder hornets. <laughs> we've also we've also had Chernobyl. Uh, Oh, yeah. With their wildfires raising up a cloud of radiation swelling over yeah. Europe. So that's really fun. <laughs> On the plus side, they may have found a cure for malaria. So, you know, we'll hey. <laughs> <laughs> On the bright side of that, hey. <laughs> Not one of those plagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so that's an immediate future thing, really. It's, it's kind of that discussion around 
what, what the next sort of steps look like. I think Alex sort of, you, you articulated that quite well in terms of you think there's going to be some trepidation. There's going to be some sort of, uh, we'll see a return to form, but it, it might take 12 to 18 months for a lot of people who usually came to bars to really start to go, well, I've got some disposable income again. I feel safe going to one again, all that kind of stuff. Um, as you, but uh, Laura, you said that China is, you know, it's ahead of where we are in this process. So what does that look like at the moment for, in terms of the next steps for you then? So, well, what China looks like at the moment in regards to its operating, it changes, it's different, it differs city by city. Um, I can speak well on what Shanghai looks like at the moment because my friends are down there and keeping me informed of what's going on. Um, so essentially face masks in public are compulsory. But that's pretty, it's normal to wear a face mask in China. That's not a, mm. it, cult, culturally, it's a bit of a sticking point in Australia, mm. which I find quite strange. Yeah. Um, mm. Because it's just masks. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're protecting other people from yourself. So you operate under the assumption, like you operate under the assumption that you have it and you're protecting yourself from other people. Uh, it's protecting other people from yourself if you go out into public. Um, so if you go out to the bars, um, at the moment, I think they're actually up to opening full scale venues now as well. Um, uh, but it was a staggered increase. It went from places that were under 20 people, then up to 50, then they went to hundred. And once there was no ex like no community spread, once they hit the hundred venue mark, um, then they opened it up, opened the city back up normally. Um, whenever you go out to, uh, go out to a bar, you have your temperature taken and you need to like put your name and phone number down. Um, but also everything operates on your phone in China. So you'll like, you have QR codes. I mean, I'll pull up mine to like show. Cause we, we chat, you now have to, to have ID for that, don't you? Yeah. So like ev everyone's got a QR code. Um, if you've had contact with someone that does have, um, who's been diagnosed with COVID, your QR code will change colour and you need to go get yourself tested uh, and you'll be quarantined. And they have specific quarantine hotels, you're not allowed to leave the room, food comes to your door, you have no interaction with anyone. It's like Scotty's uh, COVID app, isn't it, in some ways? Uh, yeah. um, there's... Um, there's a couple of questions coming through, which I'll jump on as well here. Uh, there's one here from uh, Alex Moores and one from Jeremy Young from Lark. Um, I'll grab Alex's first because it came through first. Hi guys, what will uh, will that virtual change later in the role? Uh, change the role of whiskey ambassadors, alter the role. Sorry, he's, he's edited it of whiskey ambassadors because being so online means the distillers and producers can only present personally by video. So do you think that this is a, do you think that's even like an incidence like this, like COVID-19 is going to change uh, the role of whiskey ambassadors uh, or in, in your case, Laura, maybe even spirits ambassadors or any, anything else really, but. I mean, so much of it is still relationship building. Like at the end yeah. of the day, when you're a BA, 95% of your job is relationship building, which you still do at the moment. It's just online. Mm -hmm. um, Being a new BA must be, Bloody hard. Pardon? Being a new BA must be bloody impossible. Yeah. It'd, be, um, it'd be pretty hard to break into the BA market at the moment. Um, it'd be interesting to see how people's networks and the spread of their networks changes things. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to be discovered in the next, in the coming year. Yeah. It's I a think whole new world we're walking into right now. It is entirely. Um, yeah. I will, I, I will say one thing that I think is probably a positive for this new uh, virtual way of doing things, especially in regards to ambassadors and, and spirits reps and all that kind of stuff, is if it's on the internet, it's there forever. So, you know, there's... there's that includes tonight, guys, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that, that's the thing. So, you know, if, if I, you know, was curious about it and whatnot, things could pop up. Uh, virtual tastings, all that kind of stuff. It's it's in the internet. It's there forever. But you know, you don't have that permanence in a in a face to face interaction. And so I think hopefully that kind of provides a new out like 
a, a new way of access for brand ambassadors to reach consumers. But, you know, it's just, it's a little thing, but I think it, yeah. it could be good. It means you're more thoughtful about what you say as well. It's, exactly. Um, you know, it's, I always find it a bit weird when people trash other brands um, and you know what they're talking about when they're trashing them. It's like, well, <clears throat> you know, yeah. we all have yeah. an opinion. It's, yeah. you know, everyone is very much entitled to their opinion, but when your role is educating and talking, I love Spayburn, just in case anyone... <laughs> 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 into a retail in the EU soon, don't you worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, new, the new juice is actually really good. Um, I, I can't wait to taste it. I, I, it's, it's, uh, I love it. It's, a, it's surprising <laughs> people. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the plug. No, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, just on a, uh, just a follow up from Jeremy's comment though. Um, do you think down the track the consumers will preference more affordable blends rather than single malts like back in the eighties? Ah, do you so that's actually that's part of a broader That's a question. really cool uh question. Do you think that yeah. we might see sort of a preference for uh, as as we were talking about before, as consumer spending well there's there's a lot of predictions at the moment, of course, but you know that you know overall discretionary spend might might be lower in in sort of like six to nine to twelve months from now. So do you think that we might see uh yeah, a more a preference towards more affordable blends, the even even if we're talking mass market, we're talking Johnny Walkers and Shivers Regals of the world. Do you think we'll see more of a, a preference for those again? Uh, Emma, kick off with you. Um, I mean, like I, I think those markets have had a core consumer base and they'll continue to have that core consumer base. I maybe, I think people are... Well, we're in the minority. Like in, people who drink single yeah, are already in yeah. the small, small portion of that market yeah. by a long shot. I think in, in my kind of perspective, putting myself in, in those shoes, I would probably, as someone who drinks a lot of single malt and whatnot, would probably move towards those more no age statements, uh, younger bottlings and stuff like that, that are, you know, really affordable, really accessible, um, and still really good. Like one of my favorite whiskeys is a five-year-old Bonner Harbin. Um, but I think that's kind of, potentially a market that people could move towards but i think i think people might be more you know kind of crafty about what blended whiskies they do kind of move towards because especially from a that kind of higher consumer level you know the people who are used to drinking um you know your your indie bottlings mm. aren't aren't going to move back to your johnnies and your shivers it's just not going to happen but i think they're going to be more crafty about what they purchase sure um, yeah uh alex what what's uh, what's your take on this do you think we'll see a, a change in um in drinking habit from as a result of this uh i do i do okay. well and truly um we will have <laughs> almost like the master chef effect um we had everyone cooking for themselves at home and um, not going out to the restaurants as much because ah more illegal home stills, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah. On a venue basis, um, we've also been forced into probably the most amount of time at home with our loved ones, um, and I think that one it could be a good change for us as society, rather than getting off phones and spending time with um, our loved ones. But I think habits will be changed, and a lot of people will or are getting used to staying at home and spending that time. So I think that everyone's upskilled almost, and I'm pretty damn sure they've upskilled in making their own drinks. Um, and Not well. I mean, they have. <laughs> I, still, I still can't make a great cocktail. I'll be the first to admit that. That's fine. Yeah. But you've just got to, you've got to love it. It's just about yeah. you doing it. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think, yes, we are going to have an emergency blends. Uh, with some people that are getting into whiskey or would need whiskey for their cocktails. Yep. Um, and I think that's where we're going to see, uh, like we, we were talking last week, um, Lockie, you were talking about an Australian blended whiskey. We need one of those. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think that that... It is my dream in life to see that actually come to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> You're a young chap. Give it time. <laughs> Um, I think that we are going to see a, lot, a, a rise in blended whiskies purely because uh, people are spending at home and they're not going to be spending that $30 across the bar, $30 to $50 across the bar for a nip. 
um, they'll be buying at home and buying a bottle. Yeah. Uh, Lockie, you're kind of at the coalface of this with Emma at Whiskey and Emma. Do you think that uh, rather than from a, an off-premise perspective from your case, from your in your professional capacity, do you think you're going to see a change in buying habits from your side of the bar? Oh, uh, from outside the bar? Uh, no, not really. I think uh, what we'll continue to do is try and champion independent brands and independent producers and also independent bottlers, um, and try and provide a unique experience that people can't get at home, and therefore we'll be avoiding things that are more accessible. Mm. Um, but the one kind of thing I wanted to kind of add to that was we have seen a massive, uh, just prior to this entire COVID thing, we saw a bunch of brands over the last year, 12 months to, or I guess 24 months release more affordable Australian products that can be bought for less than a hundred dollars that are Australian whiskeys produced here, blended here, et cetera, et cetera. Twofold. They're actually incredible whiskeys like twofold, which started this resurgence of affordable Aussie whiskey, fantastic product. And I could not champion that more. Um, the gospel with their, their rye spirit um, and Archie Rosen, et cetera. They, these are all incredible whiskeys that have come out that will be really good products for people to work with at home. And I think we are starting to see a move away, even prior to this, we're starting to see a move away from people just buying incredibly expensive whiskey to just have at home. People were going to be drinking more affordable whiskeys and then have their special bottles they pull out on special occasions. Well, there's actually a question that will tie into that, but I just want to hear from Laura on this uh, in terms of uh, what do you see as the pattern changing in your capacity, both here and in China, maybe? Um. In regards to markets, it's very different for China. So uh, China is quite a young, like in regards to education around uh, products, China is quite a young market, but it's also quite a like hungry market. So uh, China is more, is so much more focused on having really individual experiences, uh, but it's very branded. So the big brands are absolute king. So whilst there's a lot of that, like they do like the, for individual purchase, the big, big brands do hold like absolute presence. Um, for smaller bottles, you'll find some amazingly well-stocked uh, whiskey bars. So it, it honestly, it's. But do you think we're going to see a shift downwards? Well, not downwards isn't the right word, but a shift back to more affordable blended whiskey market like we saw in the 1980s. Mm, for ch for China, it's still it's still moving up, like as because at the moment China isn't moving back to the blended whiskies; they're stepping into them at the moment um, for the vast majority of the market. So yes, there is a like a small pocket of people who are extremely well wealthy, and the uh, like having single malts is a part of their lexicon and their drinking, but the majority of the population are uh, still learning what product, like what Western spirits are. Like yep. at the same time, like when you think about Baiju, Baiju, which is the broadest, the highest consumed spirit globally, and it's only drunk in China, mm -hmm. the, uh, a lot of the population is still learning how to taste Western spirits. Only because a lot of people have joined the uh, the stream just recently. Uh, I just want to welcome uh, welcome everyone who's been tuning into Whiskey Roundtable Week Five. I'm sitting here tonight with Alex Dahlenberg, Andy Milne, Emma Cookson, Lockie Watt, and Laura Thompson, uh, talking all things good spirits, all things whiskey roundtable, all things future of bars. Uh, big shout out, hello David Taylor, Seamus Carroll, El Tote, Richard Matthews, lots of lots of people from the trade joining in as well, which is great. Um, there was a question that which popped up here. Um, Matt, I'll just jump in just before you, you dive into the next question. Just yep. from a, a perspective of looking at scan and, and looking at retail retail scan over the last six weeks. Yep. Um, <clears throat> it was really interesting to watch, you know, in sort of big big retailers uh, and looking at their, their sales out. So not our sales to them, but their sales out um, from store over the last six weeks. And 
and you look at a bit of data and you sort of go, okay, this is interesting. So the very beginning of you know lockdown and um, you know, us going going to working from home, we saw a huge huge demand in sort of mainstream spirits, you call it. So you know your your everyday brands um, that sort of on that sort of thirty five forty five dollar mark, uh, and it was very much you know what can I afford and what can I have at home so that I've definitely got two or three bottles of something at home ready to save me from my mental family or partner or housemates or whatever it might be. Um, but what we've seen is actually that sort of, <clears throat> that was a heavy wave in March and April was actually kind of moved across and we're looking at more premium brands. And, and I think people have made that step to, okay, this is a bit more life. I want something a bit nicer. And so people are upgrading to more premium products and more premium whiskies are being purchased. So, I think it's We're certainly seeing that initial address, shock, yeah, and then it's like, okay, actually, no, I, I do want something good. So let's. I also let's think, I also think that um, with all of our online tastings that are going around and the education that's going around from bars and from producers and larger brands, people are actually getting these premium products and trying to learn about what they're drinking, and so people mm. are trying to effectively upskill and learn about stuff. And you're probably hearing. You're hearing a lot more home, from yeah. you're hearing a lot more from you know the premium brands than you are from your everyday brands. You know, exactly. They can't so people are trying to in a meaningful way, other than we're here for you in this tough time. It's like sure, sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it um it could also be another another fun thing. It could be is um you know those those premium whiskey drinkers well they've run out of everything on their shelf by april <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. slowly getting through and now they're like crap now i need to restock <laughs> mm. i know that, i know that feeling yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, a question from regan owens he asks a question for the panel has anyone opened anything special that they were saving in their home bars or uh in the in the last few months uh has anyone opened anything that they thought Ah, well, I'm, I'm stuck in isolation and I'm opening something nice kind of moment. I mean, it, uh, Emma seems, you, you seem to already be sorted there. What have you got on your table there? Uh, I've got a, um, so whenever I take a, a particular liking to a bottle of whiskey at work, um, typically I'll buy the last like half dram that's in it um, and then just take the bottle home. And, but I don't drink that much at home. Um, so they usually, you know, kind of sit there for a little bit, not too long, I promise. Um, but I've got a um, Kingsbury from Japan, seven-year-old Altavine and a 10-year-old Hazelburn Sauternes cask. But um, That's where that went. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's where that went. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, for me, I don't drink a lot at home. So I haven't cracked into that many, but also being in the process of moving, most of them are, are you know, all wrapped up in bubble wrap. So these ones, I was like, no, nah, they have to go before I move house. So. <laughs> uh, Andy. Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in a similar position. Uh, most, most of the time I'm consuming in, in venues and bars rather than at home. So uh, although there's stuff that's opened, that's, you know, opened with you know, a small amount. And yeah, you know, I think uh, last time I had some friends over, I had um, a couple of single cast bottlings or special bottlings. Um, from whiskey exchange let's see uh, from my old show it was a 21 year old ben nevis and a 11 year old lecheg yep uh, that are just superb and i sort of kept them to share with friends and now i'm just like yeah it's it's really good i'm gonna keep drinking that and normally it would probably just sit there for for ages until you know the next people come come to our house and we can share it with them but uh yeah it's that and there's there's been quite a few minis uh, and sort of small bottles. I, I buy a lot of minis as and when I can um, to just try weird things and unusual things. And so a lot of those that I've just been sitting on going, yeah, I'll have that at some point. I've, I then just sort of go, yep, so let's try yeah. three or four minis in a night. And I'm always torn on minis. I'm always torn. It's kind of like I love the idea of minis, but uh, and then I meet mini collectors and they're weirder than I am. So I just I go, mean, <laughs> they're, they're, I just, they are unique. Just, yeah, unique. They are but unique. I mean, things like this, that's, uh, yeah, that's an eight, old eight-year-old Pilmont Balvenie. So if I want to get into the business, you know, I, I worked for one of the biggest collectors of whiskey in the world. Uh, and so 
you get set down a rabbit hole because he just like, try this, try this, try this, try this. And you're like, shit, I can't afford any of this. Uh, and so you get privileged with all this amazing liquid, but then you can never purchase it again. So I realized that minis were my way to actually be yeah. able to yeah. sort of have a collection of some really cool stuff so I can go, yeah, I'm going to drink that one day. I'm going to try that. And so you suddenly get 1960s, 1970s distillate yeah, yeah. of really interesting stuff. And yeah. I can tell you, you know, having opened various bits and bobs on these uh, calls, some of them are terrible. Um, <laughs> utterly, yeah, utterly yeah. shocking. Yeah, absolutely yep. they are. <laughs> yeah. they, they, um, they, they do that. That's the other thing with minis. They're unreliable. They, you just, yeah, they, are. they are. They're totally they're unreliable. Really, yeah. You can open up and some yeah. amazing <clears throat> things and they just, they just turn to, they, they taste like mushy peas in a bottle and you're like, oh, that was a shame. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you, you, you kind of <laughs> buy it based on feel level and, how it looks, but even then, you're like, yeah, that looks good. This is what was that, nice. Alex? Sorry. I love mushy peas. I was about to say the same. <laughs> I love mushy peas. Okay, but you get what I mean. Maybe mushy yeah. peas sitting in a steel tin. I don't yeah. know. There's, there's a certain flavor there, like that vegetal tin flavor that some of those minis give off. Uh, yeah. Laura, for yourself, have you been have you been killing off anything? Uh, yes, I've been, I'm lucky enough to be staying with Joey Ty and Tom Scott. So there's been some delicious, <laughs> delicious whiskeys open. Yeah. Uh, but really, that's myself, I'm definitely more of a agave girl. So uh, for my birthday, we cracked some tapatio and yaho. Um, and actually Fantastic. <laughs> We've actually we're actually blessed to have um, uh, Tom's son Lachlan joining us tonight. So this, is, this is really great. Dad who left. Dad who left him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm good there today. <laughs> Alex, what have you been? I know I've seen a few things you've been opening, Alex, and having a on display in some of your in some of your um your yeah, streams. So what, what's going on with you? Uh, I'm drinking hot chocolate tonight. Um, but uh, I have started opening sample bottles this week that I have. Um, I found, don't, don't hate me all day. No, no, no. No hate for this. But I found a bag of samples uh, that was left for me in one of the venues. Um, and I, so the team just put like any samples that are left for me in a bag. Um, and any that I get given, I put in a bag and I take them home. So I've started on that bag. Um, and I happened, I remembered when I found it, but I have a sample bottle of the Ardbeg Wee Beastie that's not released yet. Oh, oh I'm super excited to try this. And the Ardbeg Black, which just has been. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so that's what I started on this week. There, I, I will be honest with you. I, it's 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 not a thing. There is a wee beastie sample in the box up on the shelf over there. Okay, you go on to all right. It's just an LVMH uh, blank bottle, but I haven't I haven't opened it yet. I haven't had a chance. Right. So I opened mine. Open it, Matt. Open that. Yeah, all right. All right. young right. Ard, young beg is the bollocks. So <laughs> yeah. very cool. Yeah, very cool. Delicious, and I found some like old cast strength Sullivan's Cove um, oh, yeah. sample bottle um, so much I've just got all these little bottles and I have a gift exchange with some of my friends that I take I always have a handbag whiskey as well so um, I'll take a little bottle out with me that's something special and I'll give it to someone and then they'll bring me back the bottle with something special to them in it yeah um, so I had a beautiful uh, black art this week from um, cool. from Andy Sai. Uh, who was mm. Webster's, who's now with Brown Foreman. So yeah, I drank very cool. So yeah, drinking some cool stuff, but in the little ones. The little yeah. ones, yeah. Uh, a bit like, a bit like Milne. Uh, Lockie, you've been, you've been uh, apart from weird amarettos and uh, peach sours, what else have you been drinking? <laughs> I've been drinking some fun stuff. Uh, so I've done a little bit of what everyone said. I've opened some fun bottles. So I've been drinking this Peter Ben Nevis oh, uh, in spirits. No, you, oh. um, I also opened my bottle of 15th anniversary Society Altmore, which was super fun. All right. And then I also sh uh, got given a little, well, this is quite a sizable sample bottle of the new Sullivan's Cove Refill American Oak. And so I was drinking that this week. Um, and I found a bunch of sample bottles in the back of my cupboard. So I drank those last week and they were fun. Um, 
So half of us are drinking minis and, and old samples kicking around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dragging the drags is what we call. Yeah. <laughs> they kick around for ages. They like, do. They're, they're those things, like when I when I moved house, I had my collection of whiskey that ended up going into storage because I moved from from the UK to here. Um, but <clears throat> I also had what I didn't realise is just this mass of samples. I mean, it was sort of I think five shoe cases worth of samples were filled and just sort of placed somewhere in the house. I was like, here, our parents hide this somewhere. <laughs> like, I'll come back to this. Um, and then, you know, you sort of think, oh, you know, I don't normally store those. You know, I don't normally keep onto these. But you do because I think because you only get a small amount. And so it's, it's a sample. So you only get a small taste of it. If you can save a bit of it, it's just like, oh, yeah, I've got a bit of this. It's like, it's, you know, like I had a really wacky tasting with, um, uh, Shinji Fukuyo um, from Suntory uh, and he kind of brought over these three samples he's like oh these are three things that I'm working on and I've got this weird little project and you know doing some interesting things um, you know you just want to give get your feedback uh, and it's <clears throat> this was to my boss not to, to me uh, I was <clears throat> it was not that important to, to him but I was sitting there trying this liquid with him and I said, like, this is incredible. And yeah, my boss tried it and sort of went, yeah, cool. Head on to it. I was like, well, I, you know, I've got all this whiskey. I don't need the samples. He's like, oh, yeah, you, you hold on to them. Uh, and I still have them three years later. And I'm just like, well, they're getting worse and worse by the day because it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. half a third, you know, a quarter left. But at the same time, it's amazing to sit there and go, this is an experimental bit of, Yamazaki and Hakushu and yeah, you know, it's it's incredible to be like yeah, this is you're trying someone's experiment, not someone's finished product as well. Which you know, I love that mindset of like this is going into something else. This is special, <clears throat> so it's incredible. But that is a lot of fun yeah. getting a taste, sort of not just work in progress, but uh, component of the you know some of the parts yeah. uh, approach. And I, it's Absolutely. it's rare that that gets to happen. And uh, I was lucky enough to do something similar at Lock Lomond Distillery. Uh, last year and that was that was fantastic just the uh, of tasting parts that went into the to to a malt because they've got what nine 13 13 different whiskeys 13 13 <laughs> different spirits they produce um i actually did the same thing when i was there in july matt um it was yeah you were there incredible, <laughs> yeah such an incredible experience to just taste these odd components it's wild um, no one has asked Matt, what have you opened up that's pretty mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, SMWS oh, cast you. number, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what do I open? Uh, I mean, I, I opened a, a couple of festival bottlings um, because... What have you got that isn't festival bottlings? Let's try that way instead. <laughs> yeah. Because they're all gone, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, I mean, I opened, I opened a couple of heartwoods I, I, I hadn't been sitting on for ages. Uh, and so that was, well, one I've been sitting on, well, when I say ages, for about 40, 48 hours. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then another one, which had been out from a, for, for a few years ago. Um, but, uh, and, and actually, I opened some old Armagnacs, which I normally, like, I had been sitting around. I was like, um, and I was like, you know, I mean, it's just, I've, I've, I've been cracking things open all around the place. Um, but also, I've actually been using this opportunity, much like you guys, I've, I've got, I'll have to take a photo sometime. I've got a drawer. Uh, it's like a big wooden drawer and there'd be somewhere between 150 to 200 samples in there. And they're all things that have been, again, sent to me or bits and bobs traded and whatever. And I never, ever get around to them. And so it's been an opportunity to kill off some of those samples, kill off some of the bottles with a, you know, a thumb left in them each kind of thing. It's like there's three or four drams left in them. So that's, that's where I've been at. Of it's, it's been more sort of bottle killing rather than, um, rather than opening anything spectacular yeah. i mean it's you know i've opened like, i've opened maybe half a dozen things in the last two months but it's just it's more sort of a case but, of and some of those samples are, are crazy like i i remember when i was moving house there was something i was i held on to and it was it was a customer of ours when i was working at the whiskey exchange so i was living in the uk he lived in holland i believe and he talked about wanting to come along and i sort of gave him all this advice and help and um some information it was kind of a continuous conversation all the way up to come to the show 
And then he rocks up and he's like, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Bram. He's like, good to meet you. I was like, oh, good to meet you. And he's like, yeah, good to put a name to the face of conversation for the last six months. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, these are for you. And just handed me probably four sample bottles. Mm. Um, and one was his own whiskey brand. <laughs> it's just like, Bram's whiskey brand. It was like, who knows what that is. And then there was a vintage Grangiri and a couple of other bits. But it was just... Was it just one of those inter- terrible infinity bottles, but with a, with a name on it? Yeah. No, because like it turns out he's an insane collector. And so he just sort of went, oh, thanks for helping me out. Here's four really cool things. And yeah, I kind of, not really knowing, I was quite early in my career that time as well, in whiskey geek in, geekdom. Uh, and can I, I kind of put them in the cupboard and it's like, I'm going to hold on to that. Who knows? Uh, and when I went to move, I actually opened them all up and tasted them. So no, I, I, these deserve to be tasted um, mm. because he's remained a friend for, for years. And I tried them. I was like, shit, these are really good. It's like, <laughs> so, you know, it was like, this isn't some stranger just going, here, try my whiskey. It's lovely. I was like, no, this is, this is top stuff. Like, you've actually, yeah. effort has gone into this. Yeah. yeah that's it's, awesome. it's one of those things. Like, they just like those small sample bottles and miniatures they just like amass over time you know when when we were clearing out my grandmother's house i inherited like a whole bunch of teeny tiny miniatures including a little bottle of glenn levitt 12 year old that looks like it's from the 70s half of it's like evaporated it's hilarious and i'll never open (laughs) it because it'll taste like shit Um, (laughs) (laughs) but you know even even my local organic cafe owner he's like hey 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 you know, I dropped some bottles off to him. He's like, hey, I've got this bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label from like a very, very long time ago. I'm thinking of cracking it open. Do you want some? I was like, yes, y- yes. He reckons it's like 30 years old. He's like, I bought it ages ago for like 10 bucks. It was nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and you just amass those friends and you just amass this collection of miniatures and you're like, oh my God. It's totally a first world problem, isn't it? Um, it is you know, the worst. <laughs> um, Laura, do you, do you see much in the way of miniatures and like even like miniature collecting in the agave world? In, in I don't really, I mean, I'm so insulated from that. I don't really see it or know about it. Sorry. I mean, the little sample bottles that get shared around, um, yeah. absolutely, you see. Um, yeah, sure. It's less seen here in Australia because simply through proximity and yeah. how much people actually travel between but in the states you sit and see it a lot like everyone kind of yeah. has like the the still strength sample juices or like this was yeah, like this is some this is something that was uh, has come out of the barrel or this is something that has uh like some like straight straight off the still this one's been this one was taken out on just the first run um you get a lot of first run mezcal that gets shared around for a bit of fun which is will blow your head off <laughs> um, oh right like so like like four shots and faints kind of drinking kind of grade <laughs> right okay um, okay yeah mm. uh but yeah there's especially like within within oaxaca it's like Oaxaca has a few different valleys um, and all up each different valley, all the different producers have uh, like, when we, we think producers, we think like a distillery-ish, like a built, built essentially a building or stills and whatnot. But when you get into Mezcal country, often it is literally um, like, some stone walls held, held up with some tin on the top and you'll have clay pot, um, you'll have clay pots with fo- like a fire running underneath it and they don't necessarily have a crusher. Often you'll literally see two guys like smashing the cooked agave with mallets and then putting it into a pot and it's rustic on a whole different level to what we're, we're used to seeing with other spirits. Yeah. One of my favorite things I've ever seen for a mezcal producer is them fermenting agave in an animal hide that they just killed. (laughs) Um, It was just like this cow that had just been hollowed out and strung up and they were fermenting agave in that. And it was a horrifying image, but (laughs) delicious. I I tasted the agave that was produced, the, the spirit that was produced from that. And it was fucking incredible, but so people oh. often chastise the SWA for having rules. You know what? <laughs> you know what? Sometimes I'm happy with that. 
But I, th I, I think know there's no legal thing saying not suitable for vegans on the board. <laughs> <laughs> not suitable for human consumption. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, the uh, the animal in the um, in the um, fermentation or the distilling process in mezcal is not uncommon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely, it's not. Andy, someone wants to know what you were grabbing off the shelf. Uh, it was oh, great. Dublin Liberties Copper Alley. It's a <laughs> ten-year-old Irish whiskey. Irish whiskey. Uh, sherry cask. It's really tasty. Um, it's the, just next door to uh, Teeling uh, Distillery. Um, they opened as a distillery in February this last year. Um, and so at the moment, all the liquid is, is sourced as, yeah. as is to be expected. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're making their own liquid and they're, their master distillers is ex Bush Mills of I think, 19 years or something. So. That's a region yeah. you're going to see boom in the next few years, isn't it? Really, I know. I'm it's super excited up, to yeah. see Irish whiskey come to its like fruition after the last <laughs> 30, 40 years of building the industry again. Yeah. Right. Um, thanks to the likes of obviously the the key players that we already know, the Bushmills and uh, the Coolies of the world. But I'm also looking forward to the you know the Waterfords and the Teelings and all that kind of stuff yeah. popping out over the years coming up. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a fascinating history as well. It's, um, you know, we were, I was running a, a training today for all our team on, on whiskey history uh, and kind of focusing mainly on, on Scotland for them um, just because you've got to pick something and, you know, you can't do the whole world in half an hour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was talking about the sort of, would have been 18, mid 1800s, uh, where there was taxation laws introduced into Scotland and they went from over 1,200 distilleries um, and, and about 930 disappeared the next day, uh, disappeared um, <laughs> because the tax man came in and said, you know, you must register yourself as, as a distillery to, to follow the rules. And so they're like, no, we've, we've gone. We're, we're not here. We're not making whiskey anymore. Um, and, and Scotland kind of rode that wave because they, that's why... Scott, you know, when you look at regions of Scotland, it's Kintyre, it's Glenlivet, and it's Isla because you could hide from the tax man. Yeah, exactly. uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. the fascinating thing about spirits is always look at the tax man and, and you'll you'll learn the most about um, spirits. I think for for agave, the, um, what's the, uh, the cartels? Pardon? The TRC. Yeah, uh, ricea. Ricea means medicine, isn't it? Yeah. Because uh, they they realised that when you said, "Oh, we're making mezcales," they're like, "Well, well, that's you're making liquor," and they're like, "I don't know, I see it." He's like, "Oh, medicine, okay, yeah, fine. <laughs> 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 and, and, off you, and off you go." Um, and it was it was the same. So you know, Scotland hid, and you know that's why we have all the glens for right. for all the whiskies is because they're hiding from the taxman. Ireland didn't ride that wave so well, um, and obviously. You know, you then have prohibition and various wars and all, all that sort of stuff that kind of happened as a result afterwards. But it was interesting that, you know, you have uh, this taxation law. I think they went from 128 to 28 in a day. And they actually went to 28. It wasn't a case of, you know, like in Scotland when they hit... 100 distilleries, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah the 100 distilleries actually just went, now we're out um, uh, and disappeared. And, and it was, you know, one of the... There's a question here from Regan who asks, are there, are, are there small distilleries, are there small Irish distilleries, or is it all large scale? I'll, I'll just jump in there and say, no, there's, there are small Irish distilleries, but they're, like, they're, they're, not, they're not all Bushmill sized distilleries. If that's the, I mean, that's, they, they do sort of vary in size. Uh, you'd know a fair bit about this, Andy, as well. But Yeah, uh, so I think it was, 2000, uh, it was 2014, 2016 was where it started to really pick up. So we've always had the big four. So Tullamore Jew, Bushmills, uh, Middleton. Um, Middleton, Middleton, and the other one. Um, uh, the Great Northern. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, and they've been the kind of the giants and the pioneers of Irish whiskey for, you know, 40 years case now. Uh, but as I think it was 2016, there were eight new distilleries 
that put through for a license uh, and that was kind of the beginning of that resurgence and that rise uh, and I think we're now we're now at 32 actual distilleries or permit permits for distillation in Ireland um, you know, that almost wraps into sort of where we were um what we were sort of discussing before about I, I think we're going to see I think that's kind of one of the exciting things we're going to see especially on back bars and like, oh, hell maybe on rails as well but most like we're going to see a sort of a, that change in uh, selection uh, unless under contract. Yeah, we're going and to see. I think, the, and we're, 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 that com- so and we're coming up to going the back to the future point. subject. Yeah, yeah, and we're, we're coming back to the point where actually distilleries are actually coming up with liquid because you know it's only four years ago, five years ago that this resurgence started, uh, and for most of these, they've not got liquid ready to to bottle and produce. So. This kind of thing of uh, yeah, and I, and I think it's quite a, a bad way of looking at it. I think it's a very negative way of looking at it. But when people sit there and go, "Oh, but it's not your own. It's not your own liquid." Oh, look, I, I don't think. It's, I think well, it's, no, it's, of course it's not. It's just like we don't have two hundred and fifty years. That's a purest cop out, uh, <laughs> Laura. In your case, uh, are you gonna? Is that? Uh, I'm just gonna refer back to your knowledge and expertise and wisdom in the China market. Is that something that you think you're gonna see? Uh, maybe maybe adopting that sort of that new world of distilleries opening up across Ireland or is it is again it's it's gonna be down to the big players as you said before. Um sorry, how do you mean like as in like uh distilleries opening up within China or the Irish coming across like Irish Actually, Well that's a good one as well, but yeah it could be distilleries opening up in China. I mean that did I remember watching that film about the, the replication of wineries. Uh what was that uh red red uh red circle know, red bottles anyway Mm. Narrated by Russell Crowe, I can remember that much. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, Interesting choice. Uh, where they there were some wealthy Chinese billionaires who replicated famous French wineries mm. and, and built them in China. That, that, I can't remember the name of the doco. It was like Red uh, Red Obsession. That was it. That was called. Anyway, did you see something like that even happening for some of the uh, the superstar spirit brands? Not just whiskey, of course, but superstar spirit brands across the world. Um. In regards, so like in regards to the Irish whiskey side of it, um, it's starting to get a foothold. Like it's starting to get a bit of, bit of a presence. Um, Summergate bring uh, Teeling in, um, and I think that besides Jamison, Teeling's probably the most present Irish whiskey brand within China. But again, it's quite like the. It's very much a focus on um japanese scot scotch or uh like there's some taiwanese whiskies that are becoming popular within china as well sure um but in regards to like the different like within products being produced in china some of the big brands are actually in the process of building distilleries um and finding their own foothold like uh a- I, did, I saw some huge announcement from Pernod ricard about a year ago about their um their development into a, a distillery in china yeah abi is also doing one okay. um, and who else is doing one there's a few popping up in different locations um there's some that are like there it's there's a lot of experimentation going on in regards to like temperature and region because there is such a broad variance in types or in like climate across China. Um, so you, there's a there's a lot being done kind of in the mid to highlands uh, sort of area because you can find spaces within China that do mimic the Scottish highlands in regards to climate. Um, further, further south, it's a lot more tropical. <laughs> um, yeah 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 so it's there's there's a lot of um like climate uh focus and trying to figure out what's going to work best at the moment i think actually i have a question for you laura um do you think if something like that happens if china does create their own kind of you know a, a, a national whiskey or, or whatever it is of sorts do you think it'll be a similar situation to like Officer's Choice in um, in India? Do you think it'll then kind of exclude a large part of the Western market in terms of spirits import? Um, I don't think so. I think I think so. At the moment, Baijiu is king. 
Like mm. the international <clears throat> spirits market within China only makes up three percent of spirits drunk, yeah. and try where and it's already and China is most spirits largest market already, and that's only making up three percent. Yeah. So when it comes to actually creating, um, <laughs> yes. Keep <laughs> going. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to creating uh, creating a spirit, it is going to be designed for a Chinese palate, which is quite different. Yeah. yeah. I, just, um, I wanted to... Continue, Andy. Sorry. I just want to interject on Officer's Choice. Um, it's, it's something I've been reading about just actually just recently about this, this negativity, you know, a lot with, with India in the way that they they put a massive export tax on any other spirit coming from other countries coming into yeah. India. Uh, and so you know, domestic spirit is king in India. And when you've got the second biggest population, you know, that's why you've got the biggest production of, of whatever you have. Um, but it was really interesting kind of reading more into it and sort of digging a bit deeper because the, the the logic behind the whiskey side of things and why why is it that most whiskey in India is is molasses based rather than you know malt based mm. is actually because from what I'm starting to read is it's actually something to do it's more to do with uh, the, the poverty levels of, of India and the and the requirement of grain for food and so there was a negativity when distilleries started kind of pushing more towards using grain. Uh, and apparently there was this, this negativity towards people using grains. It's like, actually, you know, you shouldn't be using this for a luxury item. You should be using this to feed the many. Uh, and so, you know, there was this sort of prejudice of, you know, if you use grain in your products, it's like, Jesus, it's like, you're, you know, how dare you? That's, that's something that the, the country needs. Um, yep. And so that's why whiskey, uh, it shouldn't be called whiskey. Obviously, we all know that. But absolutely. Um, it's it's interesting. It was interesting to sort of see it from that perspective. Actually, you know, we're we're looking at it as they're they're creating it to a way that that you know pleases their country and and satisfies the the needs of their country. And so, much Just the same as as, as Baiju, is a, by, Baiju's king because that's that's what you've got abundance of. It's yeah. like you know, it's in the same Japan produces something like ten percent of the amount of barley that. Is required for the whiskey that Japan consumes, uh, sort of produces. Absolutely. Like on, only about ten percent of the barley is coming from Japan because the popularity and the demand is so high, and Japan is a barley producing country, <laughs> exactly. so they have to they yeah. have to get it in from somewhere else. And so you know, this logical thing of you know why is American whiskey made of rye and why is it made of corn? It's because the Europeans settled there and it's like, oh, rye grows really well here. Cool, we'll grow rye. And corn grows really well here. We'll grow corn. It's like, it's, it's but that really goes back to the discussion of, of, of sort of uh, it needs to be, uh, it's, um, it's the reason for being argument again. It, it, mm. Yeah, it, it's mm, you, you're using the resources that you have rather than the ones you need to import to, the, to a large extent and creating for the palate and market that suits. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, I, and that's why I, I think there's an Australian palate and I think that Australian palate has been uh, largely Satisfied. dictated by, by the wine market, if I'm being honest. I think yeah. the wine market controls that in Australia. Mm. Um, and I think in other markets, I'm obviously wine is going to be huge in other markets and beer is going to be huge in others. Uh, of course, Australia is big in wine and beer, of course, but I think the wine market controls the palate for what we see in spirits uh, yeah. that would be in a lot of countries, I'm sure. Um, like everything I hear here is, you know, it's just like I want a big sherry cask or a big wine cask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's big, it's gonna be big, big, big. big. Gonna be massive. And I'm like, this is this is an amazing ex bourbon cask. And it's like, yeah, yeah I'm not interested. <laughs> I, I, it's, 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 well, I think that's a bit of a shame ever, is it? We sort of we have like what we call what I like to call um, Robert Parker palettes, and we and we end up with these this um well every wine's got to be these um 100 out of 100 big bold Shiraz kind of flavors these big yeah. spicy rich bold shiraz flavors in wine yeah. meanwhile people are always uh people love to shit on things like white wines from the hunter valley or something you know because it's like <laughs> oh well, that's, that's not cool because it's hunter valley and it's not barossa reds or something so yeah. <laughs> anyway but yeah anyway that's well, i'm gonna go completely off topic and uh i think we're gonna have to we'll have to call it a night shortly uh i don't think there's any other questions coming in from anyone um sam licardi says 
sample bottles may be one of the best perks of being a BA. <laughs> uh, there was actually a comment that Andy, you wanted off for a moment. There was a comment here, which you, I think you've already seen. Uh, he says that Andy Milne, that beard is majestic. <laughs> so, uh, you, you get beard of the night. Well done. <laughs> I like his beard. Yes. <laughs> like, for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sadly a very long way away from my barber. Um, so I, I, I get my hair cut at the barber shop in the CBD. Uh, but it is a good 15 kilometers from my house. And so while I'm in isolation, I'm, I'm keen not to get on public transport and not to, to get in the yeah, cab yeah. just for the sake of getting a haircut. So no, um, I'm, 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 that's right. I'm, I'm also I, over I, here. I feel bad for the day that I walk in there and, and see them having not had my haircut for, uh, we're coming up two months now. Um, and so I, I do feel bad for the job that they have to do. I walk in and say, look, there's, there's a lot of repair lot three of, months of damage. Go. <laughs> of at the moment, but if, if you want my stock tip, invest in, in hairdressers. There you go. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's all we've got yeah. time for tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to do a special thank out to, thanks to Emma, Alex, Andy, Lockie, Laura, special guest, Laura tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Mm. Really great to connect with you thank and you. hear your insights on everything we discussed. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, Roundtable Week Six will be back next Wednesday night. Uh, I believe your um, your host chair will be um, Wednesday night. Wednesday night is the next one. It's Wednesday tonight. It's today's yeah. Wednesday, by the way, everyone. In case you're watching. Um, Scotty back next week. Scotty yeah, we might get Scotty back next week. Uh, see how we go. Um, he's been he's been um, a bit under the radar. He's taken a bit of leave, and he's he's uh, he's put me he's put me uh, looking after things here, which is uh, which is dangerous enough. Thank you, everyone, so much. Be back. Uh, I'll, we'll all be back. I'll see you all. Um, thank you again to everyone who tuned in. Thanks for all the great questions. That, great questions, everyone. And we'll see you all um, next week for Roundtable. SMWS goes live with Alex Dahlenberg, who's right here uh, tomorrow night for a, um, a special appearance. And we're going to have a great chat tomorrow night. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much. And we'll see you soon. Bye, see you later. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>